Howdy, friends. Uh, so, it's that time again. I've got another backlight kit. Um, this thing just arrived, I think it just came out a couple weeks ago, as of the time of filming. Um, so, probably by the time you see this video, it's been out a little bit longer than that. Anyway, uh, this is how it was shipped to me. I've got bubble wrap inside bubble wrap. Taped closed. <laughs> And that's it. That's the uh, entirety of the kit. You get one piece with a, uh, a loose wire. Um, do be careful though. Uh, the adhesive for the screen lens is uncovered under the ribbon and if the ribbon gets kind of tangled up you have to very carefully peel that up. Um, won't damage the ribbon unless you pull too hard and, and, and yank, you know, when it releases, but a little inconvenient, but not too bad otherwise. Um, one of the new things they're doing with this kit, as weird as it is, uh, they've got the whole thing kind of self-contained, so it's more drop-in, I guess. Uh, I, I guess the idea is to make it look a little bit more like an OEM screen, um, maybe to make it a little bit more appealing for those that are less willing to uh, get their hands dirty as they so to say um, but realistically if you get one of these and um, pull that shielding off that's all it is you could just pop that off it's just a regular backlight kit hooked up to their LCD in fact if we grab the Game Boy Advance version of this kit, which I also have, but we're not going to be covering today. Um, at least not in this video. Uh, pop this open here, you can see it uses the exact same LCD. Ooh. See the uh, ribbon's the same, and if you look at the markings on the back there, you know, they're, they're the same LCD. Um, if you look around the perimeter of the LCD, you can even see these little clips that the shielding was attached to. So if I wanted to attach this shielding to the Game Boy Advance version of the LCD, I certainly could. It'll just pop right on, and if I latched those clips, it would be a pain in the butt to get off. But anyway, uh, other point of interest is the board itself for the adapter kit. Uh, the only real difference I see between these two Helps if I uh, put it the right way around, huh? Um, there is a label on the Game Boy Advance version that has the uh, button pads for soldering up button controls, whereas there is no label on the SP version. I don't... If this is anything like the previous versions, even though the hardware is identical, the firmware between these two boards is different, and these button controls just don't work, even if you tried wiring them up. Um... We're not going to play with that in this video, but I, I, I don't expect it to be any different than their previous kits. Otherwise, yeah, the hardware is pretty much identical. Let's go ahead and get this put away. I'll cover the Game Boy Advance version at some point. But for now, we're just going to stick with the SP. And... As well, I do have an extra SP kit because uh, I've got some shenanigans planned. I want to go ahead and get that cut up. Anyway, so back to back to the beginning here. We just have the kit with our little crimped ribbon and our wire. And tonight's donor is going to be this SP that I modded years ago. And I don't know, it works perfectly fine, but we're going to mod it again. Why not, yeah? Um, so to do that, I'm going to, I have this original SP screen that I'm going to plug in just so we can grab some baseline power usage measurements. Um, oh, this thing has touch sensors. I found it. I found the touch sensors on the back. Okay. Um, and we'll test it with the same cart I always test with my power supply so we can get some concrete power usage numbers. Uh, one weird thing in particular with this specific Game Boy Advance install that I did. Uh, I am using the one chip brand 
not really a brand, but unbranded backlight kit in this console, but I have a funny playing LCD in this console. Um, I just like the look of funny playing's LCDs better because they're fully laminated. Uh, there, there's no gap between the LCD and the lens itself. Um, it's very, very clean appearance, but I left the one chip kit in here specifically because I was doing some comparisons and, and, um, you know, drag racing as it were. Um, but now that one chip is updating their lineup, I suppose I can update this thing too. So let's go ahead and get it torn down. That's what battery had in there. Okay. I was wondering what happened to that. I don't use this SP frequently. In fact, I've only really used it for, um, well, the channel for testing. Six screws plus the battery cover and the back will come right out. Um, usually you want to flip the thing over and then lift it off because um, otherwise your power switch falls out. Uh, the little square nut for the battery door tends to fall out. Sometimes the shoulder buttons fall out. But not too unreasonable. Um, I don't think we need that for now. We need to go ahead and get the existing kit unhooked and because I did solder up button controls I will need my soldering iron Pop that latch. Give me just a little bit more slack on this thing. I'm going to unsolder this from both ends. Just to make feeding that through a little bit easier. Okay. And I don't want to reuse this wire just because it's bit of a thicker gauge, a little bit harder to fit in the housing, um, so I'll just use the new wire instead. Doesn't make a difference, it's not carrying power or anything. All right. Let's dump this stuff out so I can disassemble it. Okay, that almost never works, I swear. And if you're reshelling uh, and you did not, if you're reshelling your console, you know, you're installing one of these kits um, and you bought a new housing and new hinges, you can just stop here. You don't need to keep disassembling this. Uh, I'm going to be reusing this original shell, which means I need to tear it down completely. Uh, if I were reshelling this and I wanted to reuse my original hinges too, I would have to keep going as well. Um, but actually, before doing that, before continuing, let's get some baselines. Let's make sure this thing's actually working. Yada yada. One day I'll figure out how to use this quick menu with one hand. All right. So the top one should be the ground, the bottom one should be depositive. And blow it up, did I? Nope. Plug in this original screen here. Plug in the game I always test with. And oh, I think I need to go fetch another screen.
All right. Yeah, be right back. Got a few dozen of these things, so it's not too big of a deal. Um, unfortunately, I think it's just that the ribbon cable is damaged on this LCD, which it's a stock, it's an OEM LCD, so it's really not that big of a deal, but it is a bummer because it's not fixable without replacing it. Uh, unless I can find whatever part of this ribbon is damaged and, you know, visual inspection, it looks fine, so. Oh well. End of the part spin it goes. Maybe I'll harvest the front light out of it someday. Oh, this one looks like it's in even worse shape. But I bet it works just fine. Yep, works just fine. <laughs> Actually, it's a little worse for wear. Similar issue. Almost makes me wonder if it's not the connector itself. That's awkward. Well, hopefully it works with the new kit. All right, so in the overworld with the front light on, uh, same game I always test with, 3.7 volts. The console is pulling, God, I forgot how efficient these things are. Um, between 55 and 59 milliamps. 3.7 volts, that's very little. All right, pop that out. Plug in the new one. And look at that, just works. All right, overworld, same voltage, same game, 3.7 volts. It's pulling quite a bit more at 168 to 170, excuse me, 168 to 175 milliamps. Um, that's a lot more. That's, that's quite a significant increase. Um, so just napkin math, if we were pulling 50 milliamps and now we're pulling 150 milliamps, that means we will get approximately one third the battery life. So 10 hours down to three and a half, give or take. Not great, um, but it is what it is. We can also probably improve that significantly by tweaking the brightness. So let's do that. All right, so we have at minimum brightness, it is pulling 118 to 124 milliamps, and then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten levels, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 15 levels. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14. I don't know if I hit it. I think I hit it, but I don't know if it registered. Um, 3.7 volts, 225 to 231 milliamps. Yeah, that was max. 225 to 231 milliamps. That's quite significant over 60. Um, I don't expect to get good battery life with something like this. Uh, the other touch sensor, I don't know, I think it just also does brightness unless you press and hold and then it does the uh, color palettes. Maybe. Hmm. Well, we'll get it assembled and play with it a little bit more. Uh, pressing and holding the other touch sensor should flip on the pixel grid modes, uh, which I will try and remember to take better pictures of. Um, I'll take some pictures under the microscope to show those. Uh, but I just wanted to flip through those real quick. 
Uh, I wanted to see if the power usage changed with any of those modes, modes enabled, and it does not appear to do so. I can't even get it to flip on now. There it goes. Yeah, about the same. Oh, that's interesting. So now it's just cycling. Well, I'm not going to read into it too much because it is sitting over our giant metal plate and I have a bunch of exposed electronics also sitting on that metal plate, so that's how capacitance sensors work. Uh, we've also got a solder pad for the uh, button brightness controls because without soldering that up, this button does nothing, um, but we'll get to that later on in the install. Otherwise, everything's looking pretty good, so I think we'll go ahead and continue. I'm just going to give the LCD a quick visual inspection, make sure that there are no obvious defects, and all looks good, so let's move on. Actually, while I'm at it, let's plug in my camera. Make sure it doesn't die on me while I'm filming. All right, back to the housing. Gotta go ahead and get this torn down. I'm going to pop the screw out for the hinge cover. That whole bad boy comes out. And then technically you can remove the whole top housing um, from here, but that requires sticking a long sharp object down this tube hoping you don't mess up this ribbon and hoping you don't break the clips on the hinge itself. Uh, it's the same exact deal just on the other side and covered up. Um, trust me though, it's easier to just disassemble it proper. I'm going to take a plastic spudger and try and work it around the periphery of these screw covers. And usually you can loosen up the adhesive enough and gain enough purchase under the cover to try and slip the tool in, maybe, and get that out. And if you do it right, you don't damage the cover and you don't mark up the housing. This is not an easy thing to do. Um, without marking up one or both the housing or the cover, uh, especially the little ones. The little ones are even harder. Um, this shell, for whatever reason, this is one of the easier ones. Um, I have struggled quite significantly with some of these in the past. Doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. Some of them are just harder than others. Um, maybe it's wear and tear. Like the materials degrade at different rates depending on the exposure. But this one doesn't seem too bad. I think this is the fourth time I've done this particular console. So that's also probably helping do it easier. <laughs> screws and then it just comes out and I've got the amalgam of kits here I've got the funny playing LCD attached to the one chip oh the two-in-one kit so I swapped out the kit in this thing at some point this used to have one of those um, ribbon cable ones I have no I don't have one handy oh yeah I do uh, one of these older ones, well, that's the GBA one, not the SP. You, you get the idea. Anyway, perfectly good kit, but I only have so many Game Boys. That comes right off. 
Oh, and before I drop that in, let's cover one more thing. Uh, if you're reshelling and want to pop your hinges out, I have done videos on this in the past, um, but I have a hinge removal tool uh, that I'll try and remember to link below. Um, it's just a little 3D printable widget here that you can stick onto the end of the hinge and what it does is it, it retracts the clips while pushing on the hinge itself. So you just get it lined up, you have to have the SP open, you give it a little press, Oh, and of course this one has really tight hinges. Some of them are easier than others, of course. There it goes. I bumped into my nails, I pushed it out. Uh, but anyway, then the tool will go into the SP and stop, and you can pluck the tool out, and then pluck the hinge out. And I shattered one of the clips doing that. That's unfortunate. Oh well, it is what it is. Um, it's the best way I've found to get these hinges out with minimal damage. I was going to say no damage, but streak had to end sometime. Uh, and then as far as reassembly, the housing has to be open. There are actually channels inside the shell uh, that have to be lined up with the channels in the hinge, and then you just pop it in here. The hinge on the left tends to have black clips. The hinge on the right tends to have white clips. They are directional. Um, I have heard reports, let me pop this in real quick. Uh, once it's lined up, you got the shell open, just slide that in, Bob Jaunty, easy peasy. Um, I have heard reports of other model hinges being out there that, um, that are bi-directional, as in they can go in either side. I think those are for late model consoles, or at least came with late model consoles. Uh, like AGS-101, IQ models, etc. Um, from my understanding, they're pretty uncommon, but they're probably out there. I think there are some aftermarket hinges based on that design as well. But if you're using an older console with OEM hinges, black is left, white is right. Anyway, moving on. Let's pop this in here. Goes just like that. We don't... We don't even have to remove the tape to uh, expose the adhesive because there is no adhesive holding this thing together. It's just kind of jammed in the shell. I've got to give this ribbon one loop and then feed it through. And we can close it up. That's it. We've got five short screws for the LCD housing. Uh, AGS001 consoles come with uh, the tri-point screws, but AGS-101 consoles tend to come with JIS screws in the LCD, but either way, it's the short screws. SP has three different screw types, uh, two if you don't count the battery cover. Um, you have long screws, short screws, and then there are two sub-variants of the long screws and short screws. You have the Phillips head, and then, or JIS, excuse me, and then the Y bit or try point. Um, it's pretty easy to keep track when you've done as many as I have, but just just take careful not to put a long screw in a short screw hole. Uh, hinge cover is a long JIS screw. Though a short screw will also work totally fine. You should install the long screw so you don't accidentally use the long screw in something that it don't work in. Uh, let's go ahead and get this soldered up. Just open that. 
be very careful not to get solder on the pins of the um, connector here. Easiest way to take precaution against that if you're not, oops, if you're not confident in your abilities, and it's okay to not be confident in your abilities. We'll just take a little bit of tape, put that over the pins, and that should be it. I'm going to go ahead and tin up the solder pad. Maybe. There it goes. And then with that tinned, I guess I'll go ahead and install the wire now. Uh, there are two solder pads. Don't do the one that's in the middle of that ground plane. Do the one that's kind of off by itself, closer to the edge. I don't know why there's two solder pads, but the other one's not going to do anything if you try hooking it up. Ta-da! Then we peel the tape off, and look at that. Beautiful. Alright, so next up, I should pull the game out. Uh, we will tin up the solder pad for the button, which is this VIA labeled Q12B. Uh, it is right top right of the right but right D-pad button. Mine is already tinned because I already had a backlight kit in here, but got some fresh solder on there anyway. tweezers go. Which one of you jerks stole my tweezers? Okay, fine, I'll use the less nice ones. Alright. Bear with me just a moment. Alright, all is well. Okay. So let's go ahead and continue. I'm going to flip this up. Be very careful not to keep get these too far apart because you will rip one or both of these vias if you're um, maneuvering these separately while still attached. Uh, otherwise, let's get some buttons installed. I'm going to use some brand, brand new buttons here because I can. I want to try them out. And I'd, Packaging is a little annoying, but I guess it's to make sure they don't scratch each other in transit. And if nothing else, I can save the bags for parts. This little cloth that is usually with the speaker is just an aperture to try and filter debris out from getting in through those speaker holes. Um, it does protect the speaker long term. I highly recommend installing it if you have one. Uh, if you don't have one, well, there are replacements available, but if you don't care that much, it's really not that big of a deal. most annoying part of this assembly but that one wasn't too bad get that connected up 
want to make sure that that wire is not going to be sitting in a weird place and it kind of is but it looks like it's out of the way of all the button membranes so it's probably fine uh, they don't usually go up and loop around that screw post but it doesn't feel like it's pinching doesn't look like it's pinching i think we're safe three short screws go into the motherboard uh, every console i've seen is jis at least from the factory. Oh, those are nice. I like that. Uh, and what have we left? The rear housing. Make sure the console switched off on both the housing and the actual switch. Buttons are installed. Square nut is installed. Let me just drop it down on top. Easy peasy. Now we've got six more screws. The four long ones go in the four corners. And then the two short ones go in the cart slot. And battery compartment. And ta-da! Bob's your auntie. So first thing I'm noticing that um, I noticed in the promotional material that they shared for this thing and they flat flat out lied to my face. Um, I was skeptical. I was hoping oh, maybe it's something they did weird for the promotion and the actual actual one they ship isn't going to be as off-center, but here we are with the most off-center screen for SP. Let me get my soldering iron turned off because I totally forgot. Okay. So, for those not believing me, OEM SPs are off-center, and this screen itself is also quite off-center. Uh, the screen on SPs is usually centered within the bezels. This one is not. So, you can see from the edge of the LCD to the edge of the console on the right side, we have about 8 millimeters, and on the left side, it's about 10.5 millimeters. Uh, this bezel in the plastic is larger on this side, but it's also larger on the glass. I don't know why they did that. I don't know if that was just the only way they can get things to fit properly. I don't like it, and now that I've pointed, at, pointed it out to you, um, good luck on seeing that. But stock SPs are the same in terms of the plastic bezel, but the actual LCD bezel is centered within the window itself. So, I don't know why they did that, but they did. Okay, uh, moving on. Let's just do some of the normal testing I do. And maybe possibly plug this thing in because the battery was dead when I pulled it out of the drawer. And I only had it on charge for like 10 minutes before the video. Uh, and this cable is like totally worn out. It doesn't work where the gosh darn. Yeah, see. I can get it to connect with some pressure. 
yeah, never mind. That's not happening. We'll just have to be quick and hope for the best. Uh, let's try... You know, I'm going to try the aging rum first. Just make sure I've got all my buttons. And indeed I do. It's not even failing the D-pad test. Very nice. So, um, for context, the D-pad test is when you can press three or more directions simultaneously. Uh, and a failure is when you can press three or more buttons simultaneously. The problem is that on an original Game Boy, any model for that matter, uh, it should be impossible to hit more than two buttons simultaneously, and so a lot of games are coded with that in mind. Um, some games, I think Legend of Zelda, uh, Link's Awakening in particular, actually breaks when you hit three directions at the same time, so it's kind of a concern. I have this ROM here that will oop, that will count all the button presses, and if you manage to hit three D-pads simultaneously, it'll flag it, and yeah, I'm not seeing a problem. If I, like, really reef on it and flex the board, I can get it to trigger one of the issues, but that's, like, that was a lot of pressure. I definitely bent the PCB trying to do that. Um, it should bend back. Don't, don't, don't do that is all I'm trying to say. Um, I suppose we can do a few more tests while we're here. All right, so we'll start with Link's Awakening here. And we'll run the two typical tests. Uh, so the first one, I've explained this a million times. You've heard it before. Uh, but original Game Boys didn't have a way of doing transparency. So instead, developers took advantage of a um, quirk of the LCDs where the pixel response time just kind of sucked, so they would just flicker sprites on and off as quickly as possible, and then the original display would give you a nice transparency effect. While newer displays have much better response times and just flat show the flickering, and that is exactly what I see here, that being said, it does look pretty darn good. Um, I don't know if there's some smoothing algorithm that they're employing or if the pixel response just isn't as good as some of the other kits, but I can see the flickering if I look for it. Otherwise, it looks pretty darn good. Uh, the other issue notable in some of the 9380 based kits particularly the one I just ripped out of this console, uh, is that the color extremes between these brown logs and the green grass, um, it, it takes LCDs a little bit longer to switch between these two particular colors. So with those older LCDs, the 9380 LCDs, um, older, I, I think these LCDs in this particular kit is actually older, just... It's a newer kit, so please don't, please don't confuse my wording. Um, though I do believe the LCDs themselves are newly manufactured. Anyway, um, the older style kits would struggle with that transition, and you'd see some overshoot in the colors when you swap back and forth between these two screens, as this particular pixel right here, or right here, or right here, wherever, changes from green to brown. But I don't see any of that artifacting here, which means all is well. So far, so good. Let us try one more thing before moving on to 240p test suite. I am going to rip out the Famicom, whip out the Famicom Classic here, uh, because this game in particular is known to cause flickering with a lot of the other screens uh, for the same reason that the, the chain in Link's Awakening tends to cause issues. Um, if you look closely at the, at the cloud, you can see it kind of flickering. If you look closely at the ground, the bushes, they're flickering, etc. Um, some of the 9380 based kits had issues with this. Specifically, the flickering would trigger image retention. So as you're going throughout the level, you'd see clouds just kind of hanging in the sky, etc. 
it didn't look great. Um, in fact, this game doesn't look great on this kit even. But it's better than the 9380s, I think. Um, sorry, I think I just walked that out of frame. I think I'm going to try and get in the habit of doing the actual game test before I do the uh, artificial testing or the synthetic testing because I think the synthetic testing tends to, to color opinions. You know, once I already know there's an issue with some particular aspect of the performance, oops. Tends to be all I look at, but in actual gameplay, Oh, I messed that up. It's totally fine. All right, so let's see what features we got here. Uh, I'm just going to pause the game there so we get a nice static screen. So the button itself, since we have it soldered up, quick presses, let us cycle through the 15 levels of brightness, a long press, Brings up an OSD, which I totally forgot this thing had. Um, quick presses, just toggle the option that's selected. Medium press selects between the different options in the OSD. Oh, that's actually really convenient. Okay, hopefully this comes out nicely on camera. We've got the pixel modes, we've got no pixel grid, we've got uh, vertical and horizontal pixel grid, we've got just vertical pixel grid, just horizontal pixel grid, and then back to no pixel grid. And then last option, factory reset. I don't really know what that does. I'm guessing that just sets it back to the default values. So if we pull up that OSD again, 711, sure. Um, and then when we're in the OSD, holding the button just seems to toggle between the options, so we probably just got to let it time out to go away. That's pretty neat. I totally forgot this thing had an OSD. I don't really think it needs it, but it's a neat feature to have. Oh, and interestingly, um, you can see... There's a little bit of retention of that cloud right up there and right down there. It's not coming out too well on camera, but I see it in person. Anyway, all in all, I think it's pretty good. Oh. Uh, that's right here, 240p. So check the grid, make sure nothing's cut off, and indeed nothing is cut off. Check the linearity, make sure that the circle still looks like a circle, especially when we spin it. And it's close enough. Um, what was the other one we cared to test? Interestingly, on this gray background, you can still see some of the Mario sprites. So I see the ground right here, some of the platforms, and then two clouds in the sky. Let's see if I can get a solid color screen. Eh, is that coming out at all? I don't know. I don't think it is. Yeah. So this thing is not immune to um, flickering artifacts, causing image retention. And just to verify that, we're going to use the shadow sprite test. Uh, so what this does, this puts a um, sprite on the screen, it flickers it on and off real quick, as fast as it can. Uh, same exact way that the chain in Legend of Zelda uh, works, same exact way that the minimap in that racing game, F-Zero, uh, same exact way the credits in Link's Awakening, 
so on. There's there's dozens of games. Uh, the the wall sconces in Castlevania. Anyway, we will leave that there on camera. Uh, it's looking pretty smooth, but in person, I can see the flickering still. It's not bad. It's a little distracting maybe, but it's not bad. So now I'm gonna move that over. I'm just gonna pop it over that guy's eye, but you can see exactly where it was. I still have a little bit of flickering. Or maybe you can't. I can see it in person, but I don't see it coming out on screen, unfortunately. Hopefully it's an artifact of the frame rate. You can see it at this angle, though. That's kind of weird. So, yeah, a little bit of image retention. Um, I don't think it's that big of a deal, since most games don't have this issue, or most games don't... Um, don't employ this method to get transparency. Uh, I think most games just don't have transparency. But, eh, all in all, pretty decent. Oh, let's go back to... I'm gonna bring up the SMTP color bars, and I'm gonna pull up the OSD here, and we'll go through the color modes. So we've got normal, we've got black and white, we've got this highly saturated, cool mode. I don't even know what the hell this is. I, mm. I don't know. I personally don't think I would ever use any of those, but I guess it's nice to have. Uh, the other thing I wanted to check, let's do full screen stripes. I'm going to pull up the grid. On some of the other kits, this particular test pattern, for some reason, uh, tends to make the touch sensors go wild. Um, I don't see it happen in here, so that's nice. Though, personally, I just don't care for the touch sensors. But anyway, uh, I'm going to pull up the OSD, and we're going to look at the pixel effects with this test pattern on. It's funny because the test pattern looks the same no matter which option. It just seems to be changing brightness, which I have the OSD up. You can see that the brightness is not changing. It's just illuminating more or fewer pixels. It's neat. Uh, oh, it's still in black and white mode. Not that that would have affected that test, but... I think that's about all we can do from here. Let me just pop in a game. See how it looks in Pokemon Emerald. <laughs> yeah, pretty decent. Let's see the pixel grid modes. I don't know that I would play with these on with this kit. I could tell from the synthetic testing that I didn't I wasn't really caring for it. Um, I don't know if it's how they've implemented the pixel grid. <clears throat> Or if that's just an artifact of um, the linear scaling that this kit does. But, I don't know. I don't think I care for it. I think I prefer to leave it off on this one. Which, for contrast, um, what have I done with it? I literally just had it. Here, let me find it. Ta-da! Found it. Uh, so for this Game Boy, I just did the install on this one with the uh, 3.0 IPS kit from Funny Playing. This one I like the pixel grid on. I, I was going to leave it on pretty much indefinitely. Um, we have the OSD here. You can see I have a display setting 3, which is the last pixel grid option. I like it with this kit, but this kit does not have integer scaling. I don't like pixel grid with this kit, but it does have integer scaling. I don't know if that's a difference between 
the integer scaling and the non-integer scaling, or if funny playing is just doing something different with the actual lines that are being displayed on screen, that causes them to be a little bit more visually aesthetic. Um, whereas the one chip kit in this SP here might just be throwing up black lines every other row. The funny playing one might be using gray lines or something. I don't know. Either way, it's nice to have if you like it, I guess, but I'm personally not going to use any of those options. Also, I don't really care for the um, color mode, so I'm not going to be using that, which basically leaves me with just the brightness setting uh, that I might adjust. And realistically, with mods like this, I tend to just set them to whatever brightness level I want and then leave it there. Um, so I don't know how much I'll be using this. I'm going to set this to pixel grid, pixel effect three here. And then I'm going to power cycle it. I just want to make sure that it retains that setting after power cycle. I don't see why it wouldn't, but just like to double check. Yep, and indeed it does. So yeah, all in all, pretty decent. I have no major complaints with this thing aside from how off-center it is. Um, and I guess how, how thirsty it is, how not so power efficient um, I will have to compare it to the 9380, uh, like I'm, I'm gonna have to check my spreadsheet because I just simply don't remember what kind of power usage this thing used, um, but if these two kits are like in the same ballpark, then I see very little reason to go with this kit over the new one. Um, and you know what? There's another thing I meant to bring up and totally forgot because I didn't even realize until now. In the promotional material, the screen itself is definitely not laminated. The one that they sent me is definitely laminated. So I complained when I saw the promotional material about two things. One, how off-center the screen was, and two, how it was not laminated, especially especially because, oh, that's not the right one. Well, this one. Um, especially because this is the same company that makes the LCDs for slates and they do know how to laminate screens because these are laminated. <laughs> um, so I was disappointed to see that they were putting out a new product that wasn't laminated and as it turns out, it is. It's just the one they decided to film all their promotional material with wasn't but this one is so I don't really see a major problem with it and looking at the other one that I have here too yeah that's that's laminated uh, the easiest way to tell I guess I could just use my two slates as an example you can see with the screen off how it's nice and black over the LCD whereas this slate is not laminated it's not exactly black but like a dark gray, you could see the difference between the black of the LCD or the black of the lens and then the dark gray of the LCD. Whereas this one, probably a bad example because it's a white lens, but it's just black through and through. Um, same thing here. And that is actually the exact reason I decided to use a funny playing LCD on this build originally, even though I was using the one chip kit because I wanted something fully laminated. So, yeah, I don't know. It's nice that they're doing fully laminated. I like that. That's pretty good. Again, I guess my biggest complaints are the off-centeredness and possibly the power usage, but power usage you can work around. It's an SP. Just recharge it when you're done playing it. Um, yes, theoretically, a stock SP can get like 20 hours battery life on a known good battery <laughs> or something like that, uh, and this thing is going to get like... A fraction of that but let's say let's say on a perfectly good day your SP got 20 hours of battery life and you installed one of these kits um, if I recall correctly it maxed out at like 260 milliamps uh, after the mod and like about 60 beforehand so let's let's napkin math let's call it 50 beforehand and 250 afterwards 
that's five times the power usage. So if we were getting 20 hours, we're gonna get like four afterwards. Um, that's not a lot, that is pretty minimal, but four hours is still longer than I would play in a single sitting. So I just charge it when I'm done and then the battery life never really affects me. Um, and if I'm doing something that I decide I need to bring an SP that has the maximum amount of battery life possible, well, I mean, I guess I just don't have to bring this SP. I could just bring another one. Um, like, oh, I don't know, the, the one that I always use as a control here, as an example. This one's perfectly stock. It's gonna get perfectly stock battery life. Anyway, I don't know, that's just me. I respect opinions, you know, if you say you need more battery life in a single sitting, it is what it is, I get it. Um, then this kit's not for you, or learn to live with it on lower brightness. I don't know. Either way, I, it's, it's a valid complaint, I just don't see it being an issue for me. Um, I'm pretty pleased with it, and like I said, aside from the off-centeredness, I'm actually feeling real comfortable with them calling this the replacement for this kit. Um, Scuttlebutt, apparently 9380 LCDs are getting hard to find, and <laughs> my slate project is apparently the, the, the sole hoarder of the remaining stock, um, or at least the most significant holder of the remaining stock. Uh, so both funny playing one chip and uh, cloud game store and any other individual company whomever making kits has decided to stop working on 9380 stuff because they're going away at some point um, that being said we still have a lot <laughs> we, we have a lot for slates we have more lcds than we have actual machined housings for slates so we're good for now um but at some point we might start experimenting with other kits such as this one because this lcd when it's not laminated does actually fit within the slate housing so it would be it would be pretty minimal to adapt this to work we would of course need to use different lenses but that should be fine Anyway, don't read into this. Um, I'm just talking hypotheticals here for the most part, but it do fit. So we can make that work if it comes to that. And I'm, and I'm comfortable with it. It's a decent kit. I like it. Anyway, I think that's all I've got. I will throw some links in the description to where you can grab one of these bad boys. Um, huge shout out to Retro Game Repair Shop for sending this thing my way to check out. Uh, I will go ahead and throw a link to them in the description. Um, I will also have linked in the description my wiki page that I maintain with notes on all of like these backlight kits and such. Um, so if you're sitting here watching this video and you're you're coming to the end here and you're going, well, is this any good? Do I want this? How does this compare to such and such kit? Well, that's that's what the wiki's for. Um, I've already done all the write-ups on that stuff. Um, there's already summarized sections that say, hey, if this is what you're looking for, this is the kit you want, so on and so forth, that sort of thing. Um, and I, I say this in the wiki, but I don't think I've ever actually said this in a video till now, but you guys just watched me upgrade an SP. I do this sort of stuff because, um, you know, it's, it's for the channel. I'm doing it for, for education purposes. I'm not gonna use this SP, that's not happening. I made my ideal Game Boy. I made the slate. If I'm playing a Game Boy, it's gonna be this one. I'm not gonna use this one, I don't care. The best backlight kit is the one you already have. Was it worthwhile to rip this kit out and install one of these? No. The, the difference in performance is like so negligible that 
Like, if I had this kit and I was stuck with it for the rest of my life, even though everyone else could get one of these bad boys, like, it, it really wouldn't matter to me. It has some new features. Sure, they're nice. I like them. I'm not going to use them. The best backlight kit is the one you already have. That being said, if you want to mod another Game Boy, this backlight kit ain't too bad of an idea. Um, I don't know. But you can make that decision on your own. Uh, I've rambled for far long enough. Um, I'm going to go ahead and finish this video up, get it uploaded, try and snap some microscope pictures of the pixel grid, uh, try and measure the luminosity of the LCD, and uh, I'll record the power usage of my spreadsheet, and we'll go from there. Thanks for watching, guys, and uh, I'll catch you all next time.